So I'm really delighted to welcome our next um, speaker. Naomi Paik is Associate Professor uh, of Criminology, Law and Justice and Global Asian Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She is the author of Rightlessness, Testimony and Redress in U.S. Prison Camps Since World War II, um, which grapples with the history of U.S. prison camps that have confined people outside the boundaries of legal and civil rights and shows how rightless people use their imprisonment to protest state violence. And I know we've read some of this in my class and much appreciated. Um, her most recent book, Bans, Walls, Raids, Sanctuary, Understanding U.S. Immigration for the 21st Century, examines the long-developing criminalization of foreign-born people in the U.S. and the need for radical abolitionist approaches to sanctuary. She has lectured and published widely in comparative ethnic studies, U.S. imperialism, U.S. militarism, social and cultural approaches to legal studies, transnational and women of color feminisms, carceral spaces, and labor, race, and migration. And as a board member of the Radical History Review, she has co-edited three special issues of the journal. Oh, here's a picture of my here. <laughs> On militarization and capitalism, radical histories of sanctuary, and policing, justice, and the radical imagination. So thank you so much for being here. All right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, not a very lively group today. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank the speakers who are all presenting today or have already presented. I want to especially thank Esther Whitfield and the organizers um, for bringing us together for these really crucial conversations. Um, I also want to thank Catherine Goldman um, for coordinating all the logistics, um, as well as all the people whose invisible labor have contributed to taking care of us, people who cook the food, people who clean this room, Room, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they never get acknowledged, so I'd like to acknowledge them today. All right. So, um, you know, I, I have my, my talk is going to go in a very different direction than Jana's talk, which was really about Guantanamo as a particular site located in Cuba in the Caribbean. And I'm going to think more expansively about how the logic of Guantanamo travels. So we have been living with uh, the War on Terror prison camp at Guantanamo for more than 20 years. Um, and as we reflect on its enduring life, I keep the 35 human beings who remain imprisoned there in my mind. Among them, 20 have been cleared for release, but are still there. 10 have been charged, but their cases remain stuck in military commissions made more dysfunctional by torture-tainted evidence. Only two have been convicted in these so-called con missions, as survivor Binya Muhammad called them. And three forever prisoners are imprisoned without charge and seem destined to die in a cage. And also, it is important to remember that more than 400 survivors of Guantanamo have been released due to the activism of people of conscience outside, and most important, to the determination and organizing of those within its confines. So over time, it's been very easy to forget how few organizations like the Center for Constitutional Rights stood largely alone in their defense of Guantanamo's detainees immediately following 9-11. Like even the ACLU was like, we're not touching this, right? So yeah. Um, it's easy to forget that the U.S. state did not release any information about the detainees until compelled to do so by such legal and social justice organizing. And yet, despite these successes, um, we are unable to celebrate the closing of Guantanamo, much less giving that land back to Cuba. So I come back to the 35 people detained there. So even if the most scandalous abuses no longer pervade the camp, indefinite detention, the consistent heartbeat that undergirds uh, Guantanamo's entire regime is torture, right? So indefinite detention itself is torture and it shows no signs of ending soon. Guantanamo is an intransigent problem of our own making that endures. Beyond the invasion and occupation of Iraq and the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, the war on terror stretches into the future against a constantly shifting, mutable enemy that cannot be destroyed without destroying ourselves first. And as troubling as its persistence, uh, as troubling as its persistence is the fact that the logic of Guantanamo is metastasizing to other locales. 
subjecting other groups to indefinite detention and to rightlessness, the removal from community that tries to make the imprisoned not matter at all. So the title of my talk traces how the label of Guantanamo has traveled to, to describe other carceral sites in order to highlight their injustice and fraught relations to the rule of law. I'll examine how states uh, adopt and weaponize strategies deployed at Guantanamo uh, against differently targeted groups. While not comprehensive, mapping Guantanamo through its travels illuminates not only how different empires learn from each other, but it also clarifies the relations connecting detainees of the war on terror, prisoners of criminal legal systems, migrants swept up by border regimes, and other imprisoned people, even as they seem separated by vast geographical distances, political regimes, and relations of power. So while taking seriously these connections, this mapping works to expand how we think about Guantanamo's dynamic implications while staying rooted in grounded realities. So I never want to lose sight of Guantanamo itself and the people who continue to survive it. Again, not just the 35 people who remain inside, but the hundreds who endure its afterlife. So by naming its travels, I am riffing off of uh, Amy Kaplan's key question, where is Guantanamo? Which raises how the site became, quote, both a product and symbol of US imperial deployments of ambiguous sovereignty. But following our brilliant colleague, Jana Lipman, um, uh, uh, you retort succinctly, Guantanamo is in Cuba, right? So I also want to refuse to transform Guantanamo entirely into just a metaphor, which invites us to forget that the camp remains open and continues to torture 35 people with indefinite detention. So while the logic of Guantanamo travels, it also lands in specific places because of their relations to imperial histories and contemporary political geographies, often on the edges of empires clinging to their ill-gotten power and wealth. So in what follows, I'll trace other Guantanamos, starting with sites run by the US within and beyond its territory that link supposedly externalized strategies of detention and their routine use in ordinary carceral spaces. I'll then expand out to the other Guantanamos deployed by other states and institutions like the European Union, the United Kingdom, and Australia. And I'll return to the original Guantanamo to connect the layered imperialism and vectors of racism <coughs> that converge at this site and, and that link the subjugation of putative terrorists and migrants. And finally, I'm going to end with some thoughts on abolition which offer, offers a framework for unraveling the circuits of state violence connecting Guantanamo's travels. All right, so starting off with the US, uh, the other Guantanamos of the war on terror. So one of the most infamous sites compared to Guantanamo is Abu Ghraib, a torture prison used by Saddam Hussein's regime and, and by the US military following its invasion in 2003 until 2006. In April 2004, as many of us know, the torture scandal broke with the release of photographs showing US soldiers posing next to brutalized corpses and tortured prisoners. These abuses metastasized to Iraq directly from Guantanamo. Major General Jeffrey Miller, who instated a regime at Guantanamo to, uh, defined by brutal stealth torture, was deployed to Iraq specifically to get moize the handling of prisoners. I'm just going to make a real quick aside here about this other Guardian um, uh, uh, headline. So this person, uh, uh, Richard Zule, was actually, he's a cop with the Chicago Police Department. He ended up uh, going um, as a reservist to Guantanamo and was one of the torturers, one of the key torturers of Mohamedo Slahi, right? Um, or Mohamedo Hubaini. Right, and he was um, lauded by this guy, right, Jeffrey Miller, for his um, aggressive techniques. And when he comes back to the Chicago Police Department, he is again rewarded for his excellent service of both torturing false confessions out of black and brown Chicagoans and for his military service, doing the same to Guantanamo's prisoners. All right, so moving on. Okay, so another mo node in Guantanamo's travels is the prison at Bagram, located on a former Soviet airbase. 
The U.S. military took, took control of this airbase in 2001 and deployed the prison as a short-term sorting station and then a permanent detention facility. Bagram has been called the second Guantanamo, with fewer rights and a complete lack of due process. Prisoners had no access to lawyers, to federal courts, even to Guantanamo's kangaroo courts. Only the Red Cross knew the detainees' names. So even as Barack Obama falsely promised to close Guantanamo, his administration remained committed to removing Bagram's prisoner prisoners from any legal process and entirely from public knowledge. So the US has steadfastly clung to the logic that makes Guantanamo so pernicious and so uh, symbolically powerful. So beyond these very publicly known camps, uh, the U.S. has deployed its vast network of military bases, as well as its alliances with other countries, to maintain an archipelago of detention sites beyond the rule of law, like the base at Diego Garcia, and sites in Lithuania, Romania, Poland, Thailand, and a secret site at Guantanamo called Strawberry Fields, as in Strawberry Fields forever, you will remain here forever. So in contrast to these seemingly extraordinary extraterritorial camps, some ordinary US prisoners present other stops on Guantanamo's itinerary of travels. So the US holds war on terror detainees it will never release um, unless forced to. And closing Guantanamo would require transferring its logic to another location, essentially a geographic solution to an intractable problem of its own making. So though Congress made moving detainees to the United States territory impossible, the, U the government has nevertheless innovated new kinds of prisoner prisons designed for people like Guantanamo's detainees, casting its carceral net even further. It opened so-called communications management units, or CMUs, in Terre Haute, Indiana in 2006, and in Marion, Illinois in 2008. Because of their populations and lack of due process, they have earned the moniker of Guantanamo North. The Muslim populations of CMUs are 1,200% higher than the regular prison population. When civil rights attorneys discovered this racial and religious profiling, the Bureau of Pris Prisons adapted, <coughs> transferring in more non-Muslim inmates called balancers by the guards, largely based on their political views and their prisoner rights activism. So designed for isolation, CMUs cut off prisoner communications and subject them to intense 24-7 surveillance, replicating tactics used at Guantanamo. Their captives are given no explanation and no means to appeal their placement. As former prisoner Avon Twitty asked, what government agency labeled me a terrorist? What evidence demonstrated my guilt? Why was I not afforded my constitutional right to a due process hearing? So like the logic of Guantanamo, CMUs operate through preemptive prosecution, based not on their actions committed, but on suspicion of future action, based on their speech, affiliations, or resistance to injustice. CMUs speak to the deeper issue of supermax style incarceration. Up to 80,000 people are confined to Supermax or Guantanamo-esque solitary confinement. Again, people are sent to solitary not from a due process procedure, but as a matter of status. For example, in California, a prisoner can be isolated indefinitely once designated a gang member. Some have spent uh, decades in solitary with no physical human contact for years on end. So nothing but the only kind of human touch that they have over extended decades, right, would be prisoner abuse by their guards, but not a, even a handshake, right? Okay, so um, isolation subjects prisoners to cruelty and to radical depersonalization. And you can, um, there, there are studies about this, about how um, people who are locked into solitary confinement for so long end up mutilating themselves just because they're so dissociated from what's happening in reality. Right? And CMUs are not the only Guantanamo North linking war on terror detentions and US prisons. 
The Minnesota Sex Offender Program confines clients who have already served their criminal sentences and are civilly committed to this so-called program, which locks them away for crimes they have not committed, repeating the preemptive logic that runs through Guantanamo's travels. The detained can complete their treatment and remain imprisoned. Almost no one has, su has successfully earned a conditional release. Even though it is designed to be rehabilitative, it subjects people to the cruelty of indefinite detention. One person died by suicide in 2013, among other incidents of self-harm. And this is not the only kind of sex offender program that exists in the nation, there are dozens of them. As one client stated, I just want people to understand that confining people indefinitely is wrong. There is a reason why they call this place Guantanamo North. So these carceral sites reveal that Guantanamo is not exceptional. It grew out of a robust imprisonment regime that incarcerates more than 2 million people in the largest prison system on the planet. And detention tactics shuttle between Guantanamo and ordinary carceral spaces within the US. So I haven't even mentioned migrant detention centers, right? I'm gonna get there in a minute. But I haven't even mentioned the network of US migrant detention centers, right? Which are considered civil, not punitive. They deploy indefinite detention and operate on preemptive justifications. So while Guantanamo's logic pervades US imprisonment regimes, it's crucial to avoid reproducing some kind of negative American exceptionalism that instead of valorizing the US as an exceptional democracy built on shared principles, claims that the US is an exceptionally terrible, hypocritical liberal democracy set apart by relegating so many, uh, so many people to shades of rightlessness. Because the logic, as the logic of Guantanamo's travels shows, uh, the logic of Guantanamo extends well beyond the US, whether justified by proximity with terrorist-related persons or just by foreignness itself. Okay, so moving across the Atlantic, European countries and the EU are also drawing on and extending the logic of Guantanamo. The NGO Rights and Security International has condemned two detention camps in northeast Syria holding tens of thousands of people, including European women and children, as Europe's Guantanamo. The, ca the camps bulge with populations twice exceeding capacity. Violence pervades the camps, inflicted by guards who have opened fire on detainees and by prisoners on each other in a so-called lawless environment. So operated by the Syrian Democratic Forces, the camps detain people captured in former ISIS-controlled territories. Merely affiliated with terrorism and, and imprisoned without charge, the detainees are afforded no legal rights and placed outside the protection of the law, as the RSI claims. Right? Um, uh, they are, uh, sorry, let me back that up. They are afforded no legal rights and placed outside the protection of law, the RSI claims, like those unlawfully detained for terrorist association at Guantanamo Bay. There is no long-term plan for these camps, even as they portend to imprison their captives indefinitely without the capacity to do so. This is actually like really a brewing crisis in Syria and also thinking about if we're really getting serious about um, approaching terrorism and reducing and mitigating the the uh, risks of terrorism, then having these camps open is not the way to move forward in that direction at all. Right? Um, EU countries will likely do nothing to close these camps. With so little public support for, pe for people affiliated with ISIS, EU states have instead been denationalizing their citizens in absentia, rendering them stateless. Like Guantanamo, <coughs> these two camps, Al Hal and Raj, operate as offshore detention camps beyond U EU territory. So though the Syrian Democratic Forces has implored the EU to take responsibility, at least for its own citizens, the fact that the camps are located beyond EU jurisdiction enables it to deny any accountability whatsoever to its Syrian allies, to its citizens, or to the rule of law. And these are obviously not the only of Europe's camps. So as many people know, the virtual and real walls surrounding Fortress Europe have been hardening for years, especially since the so-called refugee crisis of 2015, which is, in fact, 
a crisis of imperialism and militarism, with people driven from their homes, often by the war on terror conflicts in, in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. The EU responded by colluding with Turkey to prevent migrants from uh, reaching European shores, shutting down internal borders against uh, migrant movements, and opening camps. Greece, for example, now hosts nearly 40 migrant detention camps with new construction on Chios, Lesbos, and Samos, despite widespread local opposition. These camps are creating a dystopian surveillance society that threatened to spread far beyond their barbed wire boundaries. The Greek Migration Ministry is introducing a high-tech security system called Centaur, which deploys CCTV camera and thermal cameras, motion sensors, drones, and augmented reality glasses with information channeled to a central surveillance room, sometimes on the camp, sometimes uh, far away. So after visiting the Samos camp equipped with Centaur, French Interior Minister Gerard Darman Darmanin uh, praised this impressive camp that allows the Greeks to hold their borders and advocated for the Greek model to be applied in other Mediterranean countries. The, Uni the United Kingdom also looks to the Greek camps for its so-called reception centers, like the one it's planning on a Royal Air, Air Force base in linton on ooze a small village whose, four whose 700 residents resist the camps, um, knowing it will bring surveil surveillance and policing they have never needed. The camp uh, is expecting uh, an anticipated 1,500 single men um, to populate this camp. So calling it Guantanamo on ooze, city councilor uh, Daryl Smalley condemned the camp as a cruel and morally bankrupt ploy to reduce our obligations to the most desperate people. And in, di in addition to, to Guantanamo on ooze, the UK's new plan for immigration would also send thousands <coughs> of migrants to Rwanda through a migration and economic development partnership brokered between the two states. Employees of the UK Home Office are revolting against working on a plan that violates their ethics, but it still seems to be moving forward. The Rwanda plan also follows the proposals for, a regional, for regional disembarkation platforms or migrant camps outsourced to non-European countries like Tunisia. Promoted by European le leaders like Viktor Orban, Emmanuel Macron, and Sebastian Kurz, this program is waiting in the wings for the right political moment, or migrant crisis, to move from terrible idea to horrifying reality. So responding to critics, European Commissioner for Migration, Dimitris Avramopoulos, stated, I am against Guantanamo Bay for migrants. This is something that is against European values. But this already existing reality shows the fragility of European values. Such values need not apply to migrants or to citizens racialized and cast out as terrorists. So as we follow the trail of Guantanamo's travels, it's clear that political leaders increasingly boost camps as solutions against the migrants always identified as the source rather than the symptom of structural problems. In late August 2001, the MV Tampa, a Norwegian freighter, sailed into Australian waters carrying more than 400 migrants who would have otherwise perished in their sinking boat. Responding to the rescue, Prime Minister John Howard ordered the military to seize the ship and use this spectacular standoff to launch an enduring, politically popular assault on the dignity and rights of migrants. With the so-called Pacific Solution, the Australian state excised more than 4,000 islands from its territory for the purposes of migration, meaning that any migrants whose boats landed on them could not claim asylum. So basically what I'm saying is all these little islands that are off the coast of Australia, it's still Australian territory. There are Australian citizens who live there, pay taxes, go to school, etc. But if a migrant boat, um, especially on these northern islands, lands on one of these Australian islands for the purposes of those migrants, it, they haven't landed in Australia at all, right? So that's what I mean by excision, right? Um, so in this legal fiction, they have not, they, they're not actually in Australia, which means that Australia is not violating international law by sending them back. 
Okay. So the Pacific Solution also authorized naval forces to interdict and force small boats to turn around. If those boats refused, the migrants would be taken away and indefinitely detained in camps located on the island nation of Nauru or on Manus, Papua New Guinea. Critics have referred to these camps as Australia's Guantanamo or the Guantanamo Bay of the Pacific. Though Australian Immigration Minister Peter Dutton re rejected this comparison as a ridiculous analogy, the migrants' experiences reveal otherwise. Indefinite detention has instigated mass protests, including hunger strikes and practices of self-harm, like sewing their lips shut, shut and eating razor blades. Since 2014, 13 have, people have died after being detained. However, as Dutton further explained, in addition to Manus, Nauru is not part of Australia. So this is an issue for the Nauruan go government. <coughs> So the utility of offshoring border and carceral regimes is not just about removing migrants from Australian territory and from Australian public consciousness, but it is also about displacing any accountability to the migrants to those other colonized nations that host the camps at Australia's behest. And while the contours of this anti-migrant policy have shifted over time with a brief suspension and labeling, relabeling as Operation Sovereign Borders, the three main elements of excision, interdiction, and uh, indefinite offshore detention have remained stable with broad political support. Australia has in fact escalated these draconian efforts, banning all seafaring migrants from gaining residency. And its Border Force Act made bearing witness to the camps punishable with two years of imprisonment, criminalizing a core tenet of democratic governance. And yet witnesses like author and artist Behrouz Bouchani, who survived four years imprisoned at Manus Island, have wrenched open windows into the camps. Bouchani reveals how Australia's camps orchestrate systemic torture through indefinite detention. Going further, Bouchani sought to reveal the relationships that connect Australia to its border camps. As his translator, Omid Tofigian, states, what happens on Manus impacts Australia in the same way that Australia impacts Manus. The relationship is symmetrical. So these witnesses expose our proximity to, as well as our accountability for, the violence committed against others in our names, even when they are swept away to distant camps far from our eyes. So clearly, Australia's approach to migration and border control is in no way unique but in fact points to an expanding network of global border regimes deployed by imperialist nations that seek to exclude and remove migrants. So indeed, Australia adopted strategies from the United States, which innovated the use of interdiction in international waters and offshore detention to prevent black Caribbean migrants from reaching its territory and to force their repatriations. And this story brings me back to the original Guantanamo and riffs off of um, Jenna's paper earlier today. So as I've examined elsewhere, the US state first deployed Guantanamo as a refugee camp for Haitians in the early 1990s, as tens of thousands fled their home in the wake of a coup d'etat against President Jean-Bertrand Aristide. While the US re forcibly repatriated the vast majority to a country riven with political violence, it indefinitely detained nearly 300 refugees who passed their asylum screenings and could not be repatriated, but who also tested positive for HIV, which ostensibly justified their exclusion from the United States. This so-called HIV prison camp extended previous policies like the Haitian program a constellation of exclusion, detention, and deportation policies, um, including the interdiction of small votes, boats in international waters. This targeting of Haitians and its underlying anti-black racism pervades US immigration policies today, as seen in the mass deportations from the US-Mexico border and in the expansion of extending uh, sovereign powers far beyond US territory. And as the outline of Guantanamo's travel shows, this refugee camp that indefinitely imprisoned people due to their race, national origin, health, and impoverishment set precedents not only for the current camp, oops, 
not only for the current camp um, that, again, continues to torture 37 humans that target supposed terrorists, but it has also anticipated the border and migrant uh, camp regimes metastasizing all around the world. So for the United States and other imperialist nations, the concept of homeland security that emerged with the war on terror has driven this dual targeting of so-called terrorists and of migrants. This concept worked to buttress national borders whose vulnerability was made so visible by the 9-11 attacks, in part by asserting a US national <coughs> identity rooted in the homeland that must be protected by the security state. Returning to Amy Kaplan, she highlighted that homeland performs the cultural work of securing national borders, um, while simultaneously producing a sense of radical insecurity that compels the state to extend its sovereign powers far beyond its borders, whether waging endless preemptive wars, imprisoning captives in camps abroad, extending border enforcement into international waters or other nations' territories, or offshoring migrant detention. But this security of homeland security can never be realized. No matter what the state does to make the homeland secure, it, for, it forever remains utterly vulnerable, necessitating, necessitating more security measures and more state violence in, in an endless escalating spiral. And this is as true for other security states as it is for the United States. It should thus come as no surprise that the putative terrorist and the migrant are subjected to similar forms of state violence. States view migrants as people out of place and thus as sources of social disorder, the specter of terrorism haunting their movements. The, this boogeyman story goes something like this. Migrants cannot be trusted. They defraud liberal immigration bureaucracies by falsely claiming asylum. They are not refugees or asylum seekers, but illegal aliens who already violate sta state laws with their mere presence. They employ criminal trafficking services that pose threats to national security and sovereignty. How can citizens trust such mendacious foreigners? They could be terrorists preying on our liberal values. We cannot risk our security for them. The quiet part said out loud is it's better to put them in camps forever than to have any kind of process. After all, terrorists are always foreign. They always come from somewhere else. And unlike the white nationalists who pose one of the greatest threats to US public safety, as, so, as um, has been repeatedly reported by DHS, which is not exactly a friend to Muslims or Arab people, right? They don't fit uh, uh, our national ID identity, and neither do migrants, right? So going deeper, the long history of Guantanamo reveals how the legal and physical infrastructures of empire undergird the forms of state violence that converge in this camp. Guantanamo's camps are built on layers of imperial history stretching back to Spain's colonization of Cuba and to the US intervention in the Spanish-American War that wrested this struggle for independence into a vector of neo-colonial control, sealed in part by its one-sided lease of Guantanamo Bay for a naval base, as Jenna has um, told us this morning. <clears throat> According to this lease, Guantanamo Bay lies under the United States' complete jurisdiction and control while remaining under Cuba's ultimate sovereignty. And it is this ambiguous legal status that enables the U.S. to deploy the base however it wants, including as a camp to detain people purportedly beyond the rule of law. And so we absolutely must fight for closing of the camp. Right, liberating the prisoners cleared for release and bringing those who remain in the camp into the rule of law. And yet, Guantanamo's imperial history means that closing the current camp would not resolve any of the issues undergirding it at its core. So Guantanamo remains a US imperial property under military control. As the story of the Haitian refugees reveals, while the camp's prisoners might find release from its confines, the conditions that enable their indefinite detention remain stubbornly in place, always at the ready for new targets of state violence. And so the strategies of imperialism, creating and weaponizing ambiguous legal regimes, run through Guantanamo's travels. <clears throat> 
Australia and European states deploy imperial relations to compel other states to host their camps and then deny all accountability they owe to those nations and imprisoned people. Guantanamo's travels show how it's not just about this one site, the United States, or any particular state. Unlike the people detained in their enclosures, the logic of Guantanamo is mobile. So even when we force Guantanamo to close, and I, believe, I still believe we will, we will still have to wage a deeper struggle to grapple with all of Guantanamo's travels. This means we need to work on multiple fronts all at once, not just to close all these camps, but to tear, about their, uh, tear apart their fundamental conditions. Otherwise, we're just like with all of these examples. If you just if we're playing like whack-a-mole, right? You close one camp, it pops up in another place. You close that camp, it pops up in another place. It goes back. It goes from Manus to Naro back to Manus. These kinds of things, right? So these conditions, enabling conditions, include imperialism and capitalism, which, as we know, is always racial and has to be imperial. There is no version of capitalism that doesn't exploit the uh, reproductive labor as if it is for free. There is no version of capitalism that exploits the, um, the resources of nature as if they are free, right? So we have to abolish capitalism. <laughs> um, these, <laughs> these, these other conditions include state violence, including militarism, imprisonment, policing, and surveillance. And we must abolish the nation state itself. OK. So I am arguing for us to engage in the kind of radical analysis that, as Angela Davis argues, means grasping things at the root, extirpating the root causes that lead so many millions to be subjected to torturous forms of confinement, and not just trimming the branches, only to watch them grow back stronger. So if you've noticed, the circulation of the label Guantanamo never comes from states, uh, from the states deploying camp confinement. Indeed, these perpetrators resoundingly reject such comparisons. Rather, these other Guantanamos are named by their captives and opponents to make visible their lack of due process, rightlessness, and indefinite detention. So by drawing on Guantanamo's symbolic power, they link differently oppressed peoples separated by vast geographical distances, justifications for imprisonment, language, religion, gender, and race, among other differences. So put differently, Guantanamo's travels point towards the root causes underlying these different manifestations of camp confinement and the necessity of fighting interlocking systemic oppression and advancing shared liberation. So in making these arguments, I am drawing on the wealth of knowledge emerging from abolitionist thought and praxis. So abolition grows out of a genealogy of US abolitionist movements against chattel slavery and liberatory practices like the Underground Railroad. Its contemporary iteration, as seen in the wake of George Floyd's uh, slow motion execution at the hand of cops, focuses on problems of imprisonment, policing, and surveillance, particularly in the United States. So it, it is a very US-centric kind of framework. But its principles are as capacious and portable as the logic of Guantanamo. And its principles offer a lens to clarify the interlocking struggles unconfined by any nation's borders. At its core, abolition is about creating new structures for economic redistribution, political empowerment, and social equity. Crucially, as Davis, argue, as Davis argues, abolition is not only or not even primarily about a negative process of tearing down, but it is also about building up about creating new institutions. Or as Ruth Wilson Gilmore argues, abolition is about presence, not absence. So while we need to dismantle the camps and extirpate their roots, more important is creating the society that we actually want to live in, one in which we refuse to solve problems by resorting to violence and refuse to create the illusions of safety for some by violating others. So in addressing root causes, abolition would take the massive resources expended on violent forms of social control, like imprisonment, and redirect them to community institutions that prov provide long-term safety, ensuring that every person on earth has what they need to thrive where they already live. So things like housing, education, health care, and clean air, water, and food. It would invest into caring for communities instead of locking them down. <clears throat> 
and it would foster shared well-being in ways that risk the re uh, reduce the risk of interpersonal violence. And so if this vision of a transformed society seems completely out of reach, it is because so many of us have become so inured into thinking that state violence makes us secure, despite all the evidence that shows us that that is not the case, right? Um, this is about getting the cop outside of our head as well, right? Abolishing the cop in our head. But this assumption that makes it difficult to see how our current solutions to violence, like escalating securitization, militarism, policing, prisons, and surveillance do not solve the problem. They not only fail to address the root causes of violence, but in fact escalate violence. So soldiers and survivors of Guantanamo have, been, have long know that, known this. As Mozambique told us years ago, many soldiers had said to me, Hell, if you weren't a terrorist when you came in here, by the time you leave, I'm sure you would be because of the way you've been treated. So our current solutions to violence are <laughs> entirely self-defeating, even on their own terms. So prime example is Afghanistan. Are we safer now than we were 20 years ago? I don't think so. I think we're worse off, just in terms of a national security point of view. So even on its own terms, our solutions are not working. So that means we need to innovate solutions that don't try to annihilate each other, but actually care for each other. We're not gonna murder our way out of this problem. So I'll focus on one abolitionist strategy of divest, invest in relation to Guantanamo's travels that might help us envision how to create this new world. So divest, invest names reversing the re direction of resources and funding to divest from social control, and, uh, and state violence and to invest in the social good. So this is basically the opposite of what's been happening for the last 50 years, where we like gut the welfare state and then uh, massively expand policing, imprisonment, and surveillance. Okay, so the expenditures on Guantanamo's travels are so astronomical that they might as well be play money. So I want us to play a game. So tell me how, think about this. This is like so much money. Right? Like, it really feels abstract. Like, I don't even know what a billion feels like, right? Okay, so I've cobbled together these numbers from various different sources. So they're not official um, uh, uh, numbers, but they indicate the kind of direction and the massive amounts we choose to spend on violence. Okay, so 120 million pounds is the startup cost for, U for the UK's proposed camp in Rwanda. That's just startup, it's not operations. So once it opens, you still have to pay for staff, food, security, like all of that stuff. This, this is just to get it off the ground. Okay, 10 billion euros um, is EU expenditures to Greece and Turkey for border control. So the EU pays these border states to manage the camps. 543 million euros annually is Frontex's annual budget, which explode, it's exploded to this, uh, this large amount from an initial 6 million euros. Okay, Australian $2 billion annually is the annual cost of Australia's uh, camps and border enforcement. And it costs about 4 million Australian dollars to detain one person in <coughs> Nauru for one year. So it's very, <coughs> it's very expensive, right? 26 billion is the annual budget of US immigration enforcement. 540 million is the, cost of, uh, is the cost of running Guantanamo in 2018 alone. This averages out to about $13 million per, uh, dollars per prisoner in that one year. Okay, so pundits are just like, this is very expensive, right? <laughs> and so maybe like, maybe one of the arguments for transferring them to the federal detention center or federal prisons is that it's a lot cheaper. Right? We only spend like $78,000 a year on, on federal prisoners annually. Okay, that's still a lot of money. That's more than we spend on students, for example. Um, and if you take that 78,000 per prisoner annually, it adds up to $80 billion, and that's just on direct incarceration costs. Okay, so that's why I have all these dashes, right? Um, the total cost of U.S. imprisonment balloons to $182 billion when you account for the broader infrastructure that enables mass incarceration. So this includes things like policing, courts, judges, cops, et cetera, right? And a 2016 study estimated the true cost of mass incarceration, most of which is not borne by the state. It's borne by families and regular communities, okay? So including the social costs borne by communities and families, this swells to an unfathomable cost of $1 trillion annually, 
That's a lot of money. Okay, what could, what would you do with that money? If I handed you a bag of money, what would you do with it? Would you spend it on this? I sure wouldn't, right? So we seem to have endless, really bottomless resources and wherewithal to socially control the most vulnerable and targeted members of our society. But when it comes to addressing shared root causes of the convergent cast catastrophes we face today, all that manpower and money just dissipate into thin air. So this predicament of upside down values shown so clearly in what we literally value with funding is clear, at least to those who want to see it. So after taking over the Bagram prison camp um, following the US withdrawal, one Taliban guard remarked that the United States had spent billions of dollars on the base and prison that could have been used for humanitarian projects. Or as Ella, or as Ella Jakubowska of the European Digital Rights stated of the dystopian dis surveillance systems being put into place in migrant detention camps. Money which could be used to help people is instead used to punish them, all while the surveillance industry makes vast profits selling false promises of magical technology that claims to fix complex structural issues. So how could the billions and billions of dollars, actually trillions, um, spent on locking up people and locking down borders be allocated otherwise? Investing in what Christian Parenti calls the politics of the armed lifeboat is doomed to fail. Its pursuit defies logic, especially if our goal is to create a livable world for all of us. And yet abolitionists are dismissed as being impractical for addressing the structural causes of the challenges we face. Massive global inequality, climate change and environmental destruction, authoritarianism on the rise, militarism and the threat of nuclear warfare, all of which drive migration, feed into divisive ideologies and foster violence. But as a livable future seems to be slipping away, it seems to me that we don't have a choice but to embrace abolitionist principles. So following the trail of Guantanamo's travels reveals an inchoate power base. So by naming those other Guantanamos, people are already making the connections among these divergent and spatially separated camps, meaning the grounds for resistance are already there. Oppressive power systems work together and amplify each other's destructive effects. As Nadine Naber argues, these oppressive powers thus make the connections for us. And so while the world can seem intolerable, the structural roots undergirding our predicaments are shared, meaning that extirpating one can shake the foundation of multiple problems and perhaps lead us to build new stable foundations on which a livable future for all of us could be built. One based not on profit or the fantasy of total security, but on the interdependence that is core to all life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Got any um, initial comments from? Um, <coughs> <coughs> I don't know where the mics went. So. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this is just a question on the numbers that you gave. Do you have the other figures of social welfare programs? <laughs> I should look that up. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do that. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's 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 not as much. I'm gonna go with not as much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Teachers can get hired. Yeah. Cool website that does that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? That does happen. I would love to have that website. Yeah, sure, of course. Okay, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Oh. Thanks. Thanks for fascinating, wide ranging <laughs> <laughs> talk. Yeah. As you were speaking, it struck me that looking at Nauru, for example, and the kind of um, the 
UK's proposed mm -hmm. arrangement with Rwanda, which mm -hmm. is not unique to the US, yeah. the UK, yeah. in that European countries generally mm -hmm. have been pressuring yes. African countries yes. to accept third-party migrants, yeah. so not yeah. even their own migrants. Yeah. And it comes back, uh, an element that is not in, in your talk, but mm -hmm. is very much part of the economic inequality that exists, mm -hmm. and the use of um, economic superiority to mm -hmm. coerce countries, which obviously, despite the construction of the global economy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. through the WTO yep, as, yep. As, as a level playing field where everybody can try, mm -hmm. is really, it obscures the deep imperial and mm -hmm. colonial and, you know, mm -hmm foundations in save, savior of the modern economic system. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that all of these are things that are intertwined. Yes. And mm -hmm. history is not in the past, but mm -hmm. lives very much in the present and yeah. the structures that yes. that sustain these um, continued inequalities. Mm -hmm. So just a comment. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree, com I agree completely. Yeah. And I think that none of these offshore camps, they rely on these um, these forms of uh, the, the legacy of imperialism, not just politically, right, but also economically. Like the story of Nauru in particular, I think about that one a lot because Nauru was um, uh, basically it was it was hollowed out of its own uh, only natural resource, right? And then it was the richest. It was one of the top three richest countries in the world because of all of its phosphorus. It got it gets cap uh, carved out mostly by Australia. Um, Australia then sells it to Australian farmers trying to fertilize their own soil at below market rates, like 50% uh, below market rates, right? And then when Nauru actually gets <coughs> independence, it's this very wealthy country, it does all these bad investments, <laughs> and then um, it, it goes broke, right? But the only reason that it allows Australia to, or one of the reasons it allows Australia to basically turn its whole country into a migrant detention center is because um, they get uh, financial resources. Right, so it is. It has long been a client state of Australia, an extractive uh, from this extractive economy, and now it's become this other kind of client state for the purposes of migrant detention. So those two things have to be thought of together. And the other thing that I'm thinking of as I'm going into the next project, which is trying to use abolitionist sanctuary to combine or to think about environmental and migrant justice together, is that you actually have to think about Nauru's um, place in extractive economies and also industrial agriculture to its current use as a migrant detention camp. Like all of these things are actually connected and there are certain dense sites that enable us to see this going together. But absolutely, none of this is possible without an imperial um, framework <coughs> and also a modern economic system that is designed from the jump in order to oppress formerly colonized countries for the uh, continued wealth aggrandizement of colonial powers. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can follow up on that? Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Following up on, on this comment, uh, I kept thinking about externalization of the border and uh -huh. how we continue to place the the, the burden, for example, on Mexico to stop yep. the flow right. of immigrants, mm -hmm. and it, how we talk about now uh, these days about the U.S. southern border border not being, you know, in Texas or Arizona, mm -hmm. yep. but being in mm -hmm. southern Mexico with yep. Guatemala, and yes. where, and where <coughs> the interventions uh, are being made, mm -hmm. and so this externalization of the border is 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 happening for sure. Yes. And at the same time, I kept thinking about the expansion of immigration activities, particularly during the Trump era, how people would just get plugged away from their homes in Indiana, yeah. you know, in communities in the middle of a cornfield, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, far from the border. And so how these two things work in tandem, mm -hmm. both the expansion of apprehensions and this idea that the that you no longer have to conduct enforcement yeah. just in the border itself, right. but internally within the country. Right. And that those people, of course, would be sent to camps and yeah. detention facilities and detention centers. Mm -hmm. So it's both uh, the internalizing of the border mm -hmm. happening simultaneously with the externalization of the border itself. Yes. And so I just wanted to 
to comment on that because as I heard you, your remarks, it just uh, laid much of that, um, uh, illustrated much of that mm -hmm. functioning, which I, which I really appreciate, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you're pointing to is the fact that the border is not a geographic concept. Mm -hmm. The border is a practice concept. The border happens wherever the migrant's body is going to be found. Right, and so migrants are found far beyond our borders in other countries' territory in international waters. They are also found well inside the uh, like what is our territory, right? And so um, I think uh, I'm riffing off of Parsha Walia here um, that the the side of the border is where the migrant is found, right? But um, the other thing about this kind of inside outside thing is also. Um, uh, we are deputizing other nations in the same way that the UK is, uh, has this agreement with Rwanda, but we are deputizing Mexico. Mexico actually deports more people than we do, right? Um, and uh, they're, I think they annually detain more people, but then they're also immediate, they're expelled more immediately. Um, so like they, we are also making them do our, our work for us. Right and like um, there has been statements from DHS that our our southern border is the border with Chia is, is the yeah. Chiapas border with Guatemala. It's no longer ours. But um, I think it's really important to think about how these two things go together, right? And we can think about even just it's it's written in policy, right? So um, these different kinds of policies that fund Mexico's security state, but also the policy of uh, CBP's jurisdiction is 100 miles within any border of the United States. Right? Or we could look at the interior enforcement um, executive order that Trump signed in his first week in office that made uh, basically the entire United States as border territory. Mm -hmm. right? So all of this stuff, it's not like we're making this shit up. It's like it's actually in the documents. We can actually read it and see how it actually works. But yeah, I really appreciate that comment. Thank you, Professor. Oh, that's the baton. <coughs> Thank you, Naomi, for making us think harder and uh, maybe ponder more deeply and uh, also very disturbing. Uh, you haven't mentioned what happened in China with Xi Jinping and the Uyghurs. Uh -huh. Does that fit into your model at all? <laughs> um, it does. And also, okay, so I will first of all say that I don't feel totally comfortable um, talking about what China is doing to the Uyghurs just because what I know about it is mostly from mainstream media and things like that. So I'm not, I haven't gone deep into it. But um, the reason that I focus on the US, the EU, and Australia is because they kind of laud themselves as these liberal democracies that believe in rights and like whatever, like they're the, the you know, heartbeat of liberal democracies around the world, where China is not. <laughs> Right, so I think there's there are some like general uh, qualitative differences in the apparatuses of the state, but I also think it's really important to look at what is happening in Western China with the surveillance and like the in, in incredible <laughs> social control over Muslim major uh, minorities there and Uyghurs, because um, a lot of the technologies that are being used to expand a, a carceral and surveillance state are being innovated and deployed there in <coughs> ways that other states are paying attention to and are going to borrow. So if we want to see our future, I think we should look to, at Western China. Because it's not a replacement of the carceral state with a surveillance state. The two things are working together, right? So it's not like um, we are, like they're just living in this terrible, you know, surveillance state with CCTV cameras and like um, state agents like even coming into your house to live with you things like that like all of that is um, definitely happening but there people are also being taken from home and being sent to camps to make whatever Adidas products and things like this so I think we need to think about how um, what we're moving into with someone had mentioned the ankle monitors before and things like this the expanding uh, surveillance state we need to be thinking about how these are going to be working together and that it's not going to be like a replacement of one for the other. And I think it's really nefarious and also very, very like frightening. And it's also, I, this is not also my lane either. I don't know as much about this as people who are deep, real deep in uh, surveillance studies, but we participate in this growing surveillance culture just by being addicted to our phones, right? And so I think that someone like Byung-Chul Han, who talks about um, our participation
in uh, you know, cell phone technologies and self-surveillance and things like this are going to be really important to us, as well as thinking about how all of that data that we're just handing over to corporations in the state are being mobilized, stored, deployed for all these different kinds of purposes. So I think um, Western China for me is important to think about and look more deeply at um, because, because it's, I, I feel like it's a harbinger of what could be coming if we don't get in front of it now. So, uh. I just didn't want to... Yes. When you give this talk, to not let China off the hook in oh, no. some way because what yes. they're doing uh, is, a, is a proportion of immense magnitude. Yes, yes. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for this really great and informative and disturbing talk. <laughs> so I think that what we see is the ways in which so many things are connected, right? Mm -hmm. And then you had said at one point in kind of a flip way, but also really real, we gotta get rid of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. We gotta get rid of all that. Mm -hmm. And then I think that in those crowds, probably a pretty friendly crowd and we understand yes. and we and we agree with the with the goals of abolition. It yeah. makes a lot of sense to us. Mm -hmm. But the problem is is that we have a publicity campaign or or information campaign that we must do, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, half the country doesn't don't believe in our goals. Oh yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So, what do we what do we do with that? So, I'm, I'm wondering about the wor the words, right? Because I think that, mm -hmm. you know, I am you know deeply committed to the, the ideals of abolition. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that word just scares people so mm -hmm. much, and they they see anarchy instead, right? Yep, yep, yep. And how do we how do we combat that? Because it's, it's almost like we're at a disadvantage rhetorically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how do we deal with that? And it's also the other thing too. Um, maybe you know, if y'all remember watching Inconvenient Truth, you know, there's Al Gore mm -hmm. saying, "I just went down some facts," and yeah. once people see the facts, they will come to yeah, my yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that you know, that has not that, 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 that's not that anything works. So <laughs> we really have to deal with this sort of like affective, kind of like rhetorical campaign and how do we do that better mm -hmm. right <coughs> yeah no that's a great question and i think that's the main question we're all kind of trying to answer in different ways <laughs> some more successfully than others for sure but i was um actually uh one of my colleagues at uiuc um james kilgore um you know, when I was hosting all those abolition things <laughs> my, my last couple of years there, um, we had this workshop and James was saying, you know, one of the reasons why abolition has become the term is because all the other kind of synonym-esque terms, revolution, socialism, anarchism, things like this, communism, they've all been completely so discredited in the United States. But abolition, there's something about it that... Um, First of all, it's very US centric in terms of the genealogy it traces back to um, the movements against uh, slavery and then also the Underground Railroad. Like they, there's this kind of genealogy that um, feels very like rooted here. It is very rooted here. It, of course, it's global, but there is a kind of rootedness. And that, you know, um, it's harder to discredit the movement to abolish slavery in a certain way, right? And so I think. Um, that's one of the reasons why abolition has become the term. I agree with you that one of the issues with the term, and this is why Ruthie and uh, Angela Davis and other people are always like, it's not just about absence. It's not just about tearing down. It's about building. It's about building. It's about making things, right? But you have to explain it because abolition, just like as dictionary terms, means to take down right, to tear apart. And so um, I think there needs to be a relentlessness in the, in, in the explanation that abolition is always about presence. And even when I'm in rooms like this where everyone's sympathetic, a lot of the questions go to, but like, what about, but what about, you know, in terms of like really emphasizing the tearing down part and kind of not thinking about the building up part. You can't actually tear down things with no alternatives. If you want an example of that, I recommend my colleague, Leah, Ben Moshi's work um, on decarcerating disability. So she talks about the deinstitutionalization movement. Okay, good. People aren't being held against their will permanently in these like messed up institutions because they're disabled or whatever. They have mental illnesses and stuff like that. But you, so we deinstitutionalized, but none of the building up star stuff happened. There were no community clinics. You know, there wasn't the kind of outpatient care and like other kinds of resources that would replace 
what the institutionalization was ostensibly giving, right? And so now you have, you know, mental health, uh, people with mental health issues or disabled people um, basically living on the margins, not able to make ends meet because um, we haven't restructured society in a way that would be uh, not ableist. Um, you have people ultimately getting mental health care in prison. You know what I'm saying? So like um, that building up part is like really in crucial for us. And um, we do have examples of like what happens when we don't do the when we only focus on the tearing down what we don't like without building up all the presence that we do like. So I do I, I absolutely say uh, uh, like see what you're saying. I actually am agnostic about what term we use. I don't care. I just want the work to be done. Right. <laughs> so like if abolition is the thing that mobilizes people, mm -hmm. then great. If it's revolution, awesome. So like some of the environmental studies stuff that I'm reading is not based in the US. And so they're using terms more like revolution, right? But we're talking actually about the same thing, that this shit can't happen under capitalism. You know, that we really have to, if we're going to the roots of this, then we have to abolish capitalism and things like this, so. Speaking about capitalism, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you followed the money at all in terms of uh -huh. the building of these, you know, prisons, and, <coughs> right? Like, you know, th this is, I mean, so like our economy now is, is based on death, right? Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. have you, did you do a little bit of the political economy work in this and following the money as to, you know, who's getting paid a lot to make these, you know, yeah. things? Yeah. I haven't followed the money <laughs> as much, <laughs> but there are other people who are doing that uh, really good work. And then thinking about, okay, like where is all of this going? Where does the money go, yeah. right? And so um, a lot of it is going to like these surveillance and security corporations. Um, G4S is the world's largest private employer, for example. Did you know that? I didn't know that until recently. But yeah, it's the world's largest private employer. So like G4S is at your local bank branch, you know, standing by the door. And they're also running the camps in Nauru and Manus, right? Um, they're also managing a lot of immigrant detention centers, not only in the US, but all over the world, right? So they do a, like a kind of, um, they're like a full service organization when it comes to security, right? So thinking about things like, I do think that's really important. I haven't done it myself yeah. that deeply. So yeah. <laughs> um, this is hello. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is like sort of related to the question about like wording and like abolition mm -hmm. and stuff in terms of um, like activism and educating people about these camps. Um, and so I was wondering, like, do you think that that should start with? knowledge about just Guantanamo, like it probably did for a lot of us, mm -hmm. because we're all already familiar with that one? Mm -hmm. Or should it begin with like an overarching education of all of the camps <laughs> because of the like conflicted narrative in the, U in the US surrounding Guantanamo? Yeah, that's really hard. Okay, so I, w I would, I mean, it's gonna sound like a total like avoiding of your question, but I would say yes like to both, <laughs> because I, I think this gets back to what Jenna was saying earlier, right? So um, it's important to have like deep and located histories of, of these different sites, and also to understand that they operate systemically. And some, in the case of US military bases, it is a system. It like the people who run the stuff, fund the stuff, they see it as connected, right? But even in these seemingly disconnected and actually, you know, the, the not bureaucratically connected sites, they, we need to do the work of seeing how they are connected because I think what's so important about that is to see how the people detained or directly affected by these different sites, how their struggles are connected, even if they don't know each other. So, um, I mean, I have so many slides, my goodness, okay. This one, okay, <laughs> okay. so um, this is uh, an activist image that came out during the Pelican Bay hunger strikes of 2015, 20, 2005, wait, tw two th two th I think it was 2015, right? Okay, so Pelican Bay, this started in solitary confinement, right, um, it, out of the solitary confinement unit. So, um, and protesting against solitary confinement, the fact that people could be um, 
uh, put into solitary without any kind of process, any kind of hearing. So, and the only way to get out is to snitch on other people and have them take your place, right? So it was against that whole system. But at the same time, um, one of the biggest hunger strikes at Guantanamo was kind of winding down after the death of, uh, by suicide of Adnan Latif, right? And so um, uh, out of that became like, it, like a hunger strike just basically swept through the camp. This is when they were doing 24 hour like force feedings and all this kind of stuff, right? So I think that there were connections being made by activists, um, especially this one was made by uh, Pelican Bay activists, right? But they were trying to make those connections that these two things are actually not disconnected from each other, right? And it's not just historical convergence, like they just happen to be going on at around the same time, that there are actually enduring structural issues and that the culprit behind both of these forms of oppression was the US state. It was the US security state. One was uh, legitimized under crime and punishment, and the other one was le legitimized through anti-terrorism and homeland security, right? But the effects on the, on the human body, right, the effects on the people inside are shared, and then the, the struggles are shared. And so I think the more that we can insist on these kinds of connections, the better chance we have of, like, of, of, you know, of creating something else, right, and refusing to see how either one of these things is legitimate, solitary confinement in Guantanamo or solitary confinement throughout California, right? So. There's one and then two. In, a, in one of the clippings that Professor Lippman showed, which was about um, uh, specifically migrants uh, when they were being proposed that they were being relocated to Puerto Rico, um, is it worries about disease mm -hmm. and that come with migrants. And um, you also point this out when you brought us back to Guantanamo and the, um, the, the detention of uh, HIV positive mm -hmm. uh, Haitian prisoners. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, in light of sort of a global pandemic, mm -hmm. not only um, the the COVID pandemic, but then also uh, other other um, basically other ones, both past and then also uh, future ones, mm -hmm. uh, how that kind of fits into um, this sort of larger network <coughs> of detention. Because mm -hmm. um, you've talked a little bit about health and the disregard for health mm -hmm. uh, in detention. So yeah. yeah, I just wanted to bring up uh, this extra thing. Yeah, totally. So, okay. So one thing I'll say is that the exclusion of people based on health and ability mm -hmm. goes all the way back, all the way back to 19th century, right? So the 1882 Immigration Act, right? It has this list of excludable categories, including like idiots, right? So people who are mentally disabled, right? And then there's also stuff around um, people who have a noxious disease, right? So excluding people based on health and ability is, or is like goes back to the very origins of immigration restriction altogether. So it's not like some new thing, right, that happened with the pandemic or that happened with HIV or whatever. But I think that these kinds of diseases or illnesses, they are very good at mobilizing a lot of different kinds of discursive histories all into this one site, right? And then are able to be mobilized in very particular ways. And usually with immigration, it's uh, to exclude people or detain them or get rid of them somehow. So we're seeing like an escalation of this with the Title 42, obviously, at the U.S.-Mexico border, which still has not been dismantled. Um, so, uh, you know, like, I, I think it's more a continuation of and um, again, you want to think his, uh, historically specifically about these kinds of iterations when they come up, like what else is going on, what are the kinds of um, discourses that are being through which that new disease is being understood. So with HIV, for example, a lot of it was around race, a lot of it was around sexuality and around um, behaviors that we had already decided um, made that person we, uh, 
cast outable, I guess, or it, it didn't matter that they were dying of this terrible disease and like we didn't need to do any research or like have any palliative care for them because they were drug users or they were sex workers or they're gay. And in the case of um, specifically with HIV, also Haitians were identified as de facto carriers of HIV based on like really bad science. Right, and so there's this kind of linking, and, but that doesn't also come from nowhere. There's also a long history of linking Haitian people in particular to notions of contagion. So like that's what I'm saying about like when a new, d new disease like uh, COVID or HIV comes up, there's already discourses that are around and available that then get kind of like, like tied to that new kind of scary unknown thing and then get mobilized in very particular ways in terms of borders and migration usually to exclude <laughs> a certain category of people, right? So I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I think, okay. No, <laughs> okay. I, I actually had uh, one other thing was that it, it, it's sort of a, a, a contradiction, although not a surprising one, which is that um, the sort of rhetoric around disease and now I'm speaking specifically about COVID is deployed in order to justify certain exclusionary tactics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Happened, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and and so again, it's it's kind of a question of like, um, yeah, both that it's this hyper visible thing, yes. um, as as and and as part of securitization, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's also like it's not happening. So. I also think, you know, the way that Title 42 um, got initiated and also blaming of China and like hating Asian people, like all of it goes together. Right. But like um, I think that this uh, what you're pointing to, that we internally denied that the pandemic was even a thing, which is why it kind of like just like killed so many people, especially um, early on. But like, uh, I think that totally, uh, the Title 42 totally goes in line with that because the whole approach of the administration is like nothing, is, we are accountable for nothing. Nothing is our fault. Everything is always, all of our problems come from somewhere else. And so the solution to our problems is to always like get the, those problems, to remove those problems back to where they came from, right? And so I think this kind of, um, it uh, pointing the, are, are implementing, are not implementing, res the resurgence of Title 42, basically waking it up, right, from a dormant state, that has everything to do with the Trump administration's, like, just total not doing anything around COVID, right? Um, so, like, you know, we were the ones who had the highest COVID rates. We were the ones who were being excluded by other nations, right, because of our terrible response to it. And yet we are the, also the ones who are saying, it's not us, it's Mexicans. Like, come on. Right or or it's uh, people coming up from Mexico. So I think these two things do they are tied to each other, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I I was wondering if you could walk us through a little bit about how you envision the building up mm -hmm. and reconciliation between the United States and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. and so I was, <laughs> you know, I was I was struck a little bit. So much of, of the Guantanamo story, the way we tell it now, starts with 9-11. Uh, and mm -hmm. when you're young, if you have a kind of very simplistic version of American history, you're like, oh, my God, this is awful. Mm -hmm. And then once you get a little bit older, you know, I was 12 when that happened. Once uh -huh. I start learning American history, I'm like, wow, we spent 100-plus years well. meddling in everybody else's business, yeah, destabilizing yeah. everybody yeah, else's yeah. governments. And, yeah. and we've had one continental yeah. attack, really, uh -huh. in that time period. And, and I, I wonder... You know, it's ironic almost, the placement of Guantanamo given the history of the Cuban Revolution. Mm -hmm. So the Batista government chooses not to keep Castro in jail for too long because of what it could mean to have him on the island. They send him off. He goes, raises more money, you know, meets a charismatic Argentinian guy, gets on a <laughs> ship, comes back and takes over. Uh -huh. And so how much of that shapes future uh, yeah. head of state's responses to a threat like that mm -hmm. and saying, well, we have to put them in jail or else mm -hmm. they're going to mm -hmm. come back. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to forgive the U.S.? Uh -huh. You know, I, I, I come from people who were living the eternal spring. We come from paradise. I tell mm -hmm. people I'm only here because the U.S. fucked with us for mm -hmm. 100 years and we had no place else to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh, small question. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm going to go back to the conference that uh, Jenna uh, 
um, Esther and I went to this summer where um, it was a Guantanamo conference and there were formerly detained people um, from at Guantanamo there. And one of their, one of the kind of consistent themes among all of those formerly detained people was that they have already radically forgiven everyone who hurt them, all the guards, anyone who had anything to do with their detention. They have personally forgiven those people. Mohammed Duslahi breaks bread with one of his guards. Like his, one of his guards um, flew out to, I think he was in Martinia at that moment, but they, they, had, um, they, they did iftar together, right? So they have radically forgiven <coughs> everyone who's harmed them, but there's a difference between their personal forgiveness, right, of people who harm them and uh, the question of justice. They're two, they're related, but they're separate issues. Because, so Mosenbeg, this really stuck with me. Mosenbeg, um, who was not able to come because he didn't have a passport, um, but he was saying that um, I can, I, it is within me to forgive anybody who has harmed me because th that's about me and that other person. But it is far beyond what my capacity, right? And it's actually unethical for me to forgive the US government. Right, because that's not, it's not just about me. That is about a structure, that is about a system that, yes, it did hurt me, but it's, it, it, it's done this to so many other people. Right, and so there, he, he was talking about different ways of imagining that kind of justice through tribunals or like truth and reconciliation or things like this. But I think it's, uh, so the question of like, what does it mean to forgive the US? I think maybe the question, maybe we should think about what, is the, what does it mean for the US to enact justice? <laughs> for all of the harms that it's caused around the world. And so, you know, it, like a uh, kind of one way to think about it is through the logic of reparations, right? But I'm also, uh, I really appreciate Tendai Achiume's work. Um, she's a legal scholar, but she has talked about um, migration as decolonization. And one of the arguments on which she's uh, grounding that is that sovereignty isn't just about single states, but because we live under these imperial histories, that sovereignty is actually relational. So every country that we've gone and fucked with, right, and that has produced migrants that have then come to the United States, there's a so there's a relationship of sovereignty between the two countries, right? And because the United States, its imperial tentacles have really gone everywhere, that means that we kind of have shared kind of sovereignty with a lot of different places. So I think it's a it's a different way of thinking about this question and kind of opening it up a little bit more, but also thinking about like if we're gonna get real about decolonization, first of all, for many places it means giving the land back, not just like Guantanamo, the, the area of the naval base and then all these other places, but also like the United States itself or what we consider the United States itself, right? But it also means like decolonizing and giving reparations to all the countries that we've extracted wealth from, right? Extracted labor from, things like this. So it really is about, um, uh, for me, justice would look like uh, you know, creating a new kind of economic system where we redistribute wealth in radically different ways, right? Instead of this kind of wealth hoarding that we have at the current moment. But I think, um, yeah, I think forgiveness and, and justice need to be think of as related but kind of separate categories that require different kinds of processes. I will also say I am not as good of a person as those former Guantanamo detainees. I find forgiveness very, very difficult and that abolition is really hard for me in, in my head. Yeah, so I'm Korean. I believe in revenge. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, as a matter of, like, you know, just like, like, you know, Han and whatever. Um, so it, it is really, I, I, I understand how a lot of this is really hard to think about and accept, right? Like, but I don't see how we have a different way forward. So um, I was in a discussion with Lisa Hajar, who she's like, um, she's like, we can, we can abolish the prisons after Donald Rumsfeld and, and Dick Cheney go to jail, right? <laughs> and like, I'm like, yes! And also, like, throwing them in jail or in prison doesn't release anybody who's still in Guantanamo. It doesn't undo any, uh, it doesn't stop the war on terror. It doesn't stop the DHS from getting these massive, but it doesn't do any of the things that I actually want to happen, right? Um, it would feel so satisfying, but it's not actually it, like leading me towards what I want. So, yeah. Did you? I was gonna actually. Yeah. I was just gonna comment. So I, I've been struggling with this. 
this, this is more uh, this is more of a riff than an actual conversation. But no, I because I, I think about the question about Castro because the the question you didn't answer Naomi is like oh. Castro is released from jail, and Castro uh -huh. is released. And then he does overthrow the government. Yeah. That is, in fact, what happens. <laughs> right. and, um, and, and, and so it's yeah. not as if yeah. the threat to state power is not real. Yeah. And, and yeah, in yeah. Cuba, it is, it is a spectacular surprise that it is able to happen so quickly with so few people, right? Uh -huh. I mean, the, the Cuban Revolution is a relatively... There's a large support against Batista, but the people supporting Castro is relatively small, mm -hmm. and, and they succeed. And... And I think for me, when I've been thinking of these questions of social, of maybe incarceration, or but about questions of when should this, you know, this is unpopular, but should the state repress, you know, mm -hmm. those who try to oppose it? And one question that I've been having today is, of course, with January 6th, mm -hmm. where I'm very supportive of mm -hmm. the state prosecuting those who are trying to mm -hmm. overthrow it and resist it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it does pose questions in some ways about mm -hmm. liberalism, right? Yeah. That, um, and, on the one hand, your talk is very critical of, of liberalism, mm -hmm. and you are intentionally even saying that you are, you know, focusing on the U.S., the EU, mm -hmm. and Australia as liberal states yeah. because there's a hypocrisy in mm -hmm. their support of liberalism and their repression. Mm -hmm. And I guess my fear um, is what happens, though, when liberal states are no longer interested in being liberal states. Yeah. So, for example... Yeah. Um, on the one hand, I am very open to the critique of the Biden administration's mm -hmm. continuity of the Trump policies yeah. and the violence of that. On the other hand, I, and, and this is my own politics, but I am relieved that there's at least a pretense of liberalism. Mm -hmm. And I'm very fearful of what happens when the liberal state is challenged mm -hmm. um, and what other possibilities there are. So I both, mm -hmm. and this is, I am one of those you know, people saying like the what ifs or whatever, but yeah. I hear the abolition take on the and I and actually it's very compelling, mm -hmm. but I also am concerned about the threat to liberalism, and I and in some ways your question I think, you know it is, I, historically I've always been like oh like this it's horrible for the state to repress those who are, you know critiquing it or you know mm -hmm. are radicals because generally those have been on the left mm -hmm. and those where my politics tend to be more empathetic, mm -hmm. but here I see this radical project on the right mm -hmm. and I find it terrifying. Yeah yeah. Um, and so I think that leads to a more complicated question yeah. about the role of the state yeah. um, and about state power. Yeah, and I think the I think for me, and this is going back to you know people like Angela Davis, and it's like what defines a movement is not the the tactics and the strategies. Any tactic can be used by anyone, and though whether a, 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 there is no tactic or tool that is left or right or progressive or whatever, it depends who's using the tool and for what ends. So whether the tool is a violent tool, right, or whether it's like working through legislation and things like this, right. But um, so the, the movements are defined by their content, right, and their goals. And so for me, that's the distinction between January 6th and other kinds of uh, other kinds of uh, radical critiques of the U.S. government and the U.S. state, right? And so they are qualitatively different to me, even if they sometimes use similar strategies, right? So there is no tactic that ha the left has ever used that can't be appropriated by the complete opposite side that wants to murder them, right? And so, um, yeah, I, I, th this isn't totally answering your question about um, what do we do with the liberal state? Is it worth even hanging on to? I think, you know, um, these are really complicated questions. And then this is also the thing where people are like, well, we're not going to have abolition today. So what does this mean? Like, how do we get there? And I think that the test of non-reformist reform is like one of the things that we can use to think about um, how do we get from what the, the kind of, you know, tire fire that we're living in now to something else. Right, but I, I do think it's important to think about that it's not the tactics. I don't have a problem with January 6 people going to Washington D.C. and having these public protests. Um, you know, I you know I obviously don't <coughs> support like them killing people, right, or using the forces of violence. But I have no problem with them like having a protest, mm -hmm. right? That is, they are exercising their democratic rights. What I have a problem with is why they want to have a protest. Right, and that's to overthrow. Um, th they want to implement a white nationalist state. You know that they want to kill the rest of us. So, like, that's my problem with them, right? More so than you know the fact that they got themselves together on January sixth. You know what I mean? So.
But I, I guess the question is, is about the government's, I mean, so but the government is now mm -hmm. prosecuting people yeah. mm -hmm. because, I mean, the question is what were, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think they were, they're not being prosecuted because they had a rally. Yeah. They're being prosecuted yeah. because they a Conspiracy. Were, yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, I, I, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it, it is really hard. I will say, okay, because, like, I, I was grappling with this a lot, you know, after it happened. What I, was def what I knew for sure that I was against was creating new kinds of laws that would criminalize anything, mm -hmm. anything at all. Like, I live in Chicago. I'm still 100% against criminalizing gun possession. Do you know what I mean? Even though we have uh, big problems with that. So I, was, I knew I was against new, any kind of new innovations of criminalization. And then I was confused around the question of prosecutions. Because I do think that um, there needs to be accountability. But what I would like to see is that question of, count of accountability not always tied to a criminal legal system. Because a criminal legal system does not, in fact, hold people accountable for harming others. If they did, then the people who polluted um, our air and leading to millions of people of dying, they would be in jail, right? Instead of like somebody who sold like you know a couple of ounces of marijuana. Do you know what I'm saying? So like the, like the criminal legal system is not about accountability, but I definitely believe that we need accountability super super badly for people who who produce harm, including the people um, who uh, organized January 6th, right? The problem is right now our system of accountability is tied to the criminal legal system, right? So. Yeah. so <coughs> okay. Thank you so much. I'm mindful that we need to oh, <laughs> wrap up. I'm sorry. Soon. What time no, but is I it? Start, can oh, I just put, oh. put something on your? I'm going to make this a comment, not a question, because I don't want it. Well, not oh. a big thing, it? but oh. it's really interesting hearing you talk and Patsy's questions about these sort of third, this sort of offshoring mm -hmm. of. Um, you know, offshoring of migrants, mm -hmm. because I think that what we've seen in the whole, in the post Guantanamo, you know, mm -hmm. Guantanamo release is a sort of offshoring of yep. responsibility yes. of, for the sort of yes. post -relief li release lives of people who mm -hmm. have been incarcerated. Yes. I was looking recently at the list of where. Um, mm -hmm. Guantanamo detainees have been released, released to. Yes, yeah. And mm -hmm. it's a little bit like this sort of alternative shadow map that you're talking yes. about here. Yeah. So there's some, you know, there's some went to El Salvador. Yeah. Uruguay. Mm -hmm. Yep, Uruguay. The Uyghurs went to, yeah, Cape Verde, to Palau. Mm -hmm. So places that really, you yeah. know, I think present this other geography of Guantanamo travel. Yes. So it's very much about what you were. USA. Yeah, so, with yeah. no passports, almost yeah. no yeah. funding, almost yeah. no housing. I can't, I, I actually wrote about him. I can't remember his name right now, but one of the people who was deported to Uruguay, mm -hmm. and it was seen as like this big thing, and like this person had been tortured through force feeding so many times and had a case going uh, through um, the federal courts, but he tried to leave yeah. mm -hmm. and, without a passport, and they couldn't find him. Yeah. They found him in like Argentina or something yeah. like that, because uh, uh, even though he was out of Guantanamo, he's like, I don't care. The point is that I need my life back. I need my family back. I have not seen my wife. Mm -hmm. You know, I've lost a child. Like all of these things. So um, getting. So again, this is about the. Um, it's not just about abolishing what we don't want, which is like people in Guantanamo. But it's also we have to. We are accountable for them. Right. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And we have to like. They're not whole. No. They're not. They haven't been made whole. The ones that we got to meet have been. Have been able to you know, build new lives, but there's many hundreds who really have not, right, right. so. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, <laughs> thank <Phew>. you. <laughs> okay, thank you.